right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so great to meet you. <laughs> Likewise, very, very happy to be chatting to you today. Um, yeah, me too. It's quite a broad, but strangely specific <laughs> conversation <laughs> I think we're going to be having. <laughs> yeah, so I think we're going to... Um, I think I miss <laughs> I misprepared a little bit, but I, I had this. I ended up having an amazing experience where um, so I'm I'm usually in in New York and uh, I'm just in London uh, promoting my book, which I brought so I can hold it up. It's either or a novel, um, and uh, since I was in London and I'm staying actually really near where Mrs. Dallery takes place, like I'm sort of between Pimlico and and Westminster. I thought I would reread it, and I it was so. But this time I reread it thinking about. Um, parties and aesthetics, and there are so many interesting things in there that that I thought we could talk about. Like the whole time, um, Mrs. Dalloway, so she's thinking about her party and she's planning her party. And I think the first time I read it, I wasn't really like I didn't really understand why she was so into her party, or I don't know. I was kind of reading it just thinking about modernism in general. But um, but this time, I was really paying attention to like how the narrative cuts out to all the different people and how it's kind of you know, Mrs. Dalloway is really excited that the war is over and she's really excited about being in London and she's excited about all this like splendor that she sees all around her, which is actually really exciting. But then she keeps cutting back to, like the narrative keeps cutting back to people like the shell-shocked Septimus Smith or the um, the colonial Peter Walsh who's been, you know, administering the colonies in, in India. And it really starts to feel like Virginia Woolf is like, um, she's, she's, pointing out that the part that the war isn't over for everyone and that the party is kind of being like financed in some way by the capital that's come from the war and from the colonies and it made me think in a and and I also became really conscious of the of the way that the party that Mrs. Dalloway's party that the reason she wants to give it is because she wants to bring all these people together there's this amazing part near the the end where she talks about there are all these different people and she feels so kind of like limited in herself and the offering that she can make to life is to bring all these people together. And it seems like that's kind of what a novel is too. And the question I found myself asking after reading this was like, as an, you're writing a novel, as I understand, like as, as, um, as novelists, like, and as, as even people who are having a, I mean, this is sort of a party right now that we're having. <laughs> a two-person like, party, yeah. A two-person <laughs> party, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I hope we have, a, I hope we have it with drinks some, sometime in the future. Yeah, like, <laughs> but um, I was just thinking, like, how do we, how do we, not exactly justify, but like think about things like novels and parties and aesthetics in an ethical context, like in the context of all of the things that have to be going on in the world to enable them, which is something I've been thinking about a lot with the novel, just like from the history of the novel is so kind of imperialistic and rooted in like class and inequality. And like, how do we, how do we free the novel from that? Or how do we reckon with that legacy? And like, I don't know, I, I guess I feel very conscious of how I participate in it just because writing a novel, it takes so much. I mean, as Virginia Woolf points out in, in A Room of One's Own, like you need money and you need time and you need a room of your own. And, and if you're me, you need someone else to make your coffee. And, um, and then that person's not writing a novel. So like, how do I think about all that? I was just wondering if mm. those are things that you've been thinking about as you write. I'm like, I don't know. That's where I'm at. And I'm excited to learn where you're at. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, gosh, it's, these are really interesting. And then like quite big, almost like um, philosophical questions in a way that I honestly would say have only really come to the fore, like genuinely, because I've been thinking about the conversation we're going to have, because I think so much of the novel writing process I mean just for context so I'm as you mentioned writing my first novel but normally I write in a pair I write with my best friend normally Elizabeth Uvebenene so normally you know there's a lot of back and forth it's a real kind of um symbiotic um I don't know like a partnership you know we, there's a real kind of back and forth to the process whereas now it's been party it's a two-person party it's and a two-person party exactly <laughs> with, it's got a very exclusive guest list normally and now it's even more exclusive it's just me and I've really like kind of gone into like um I'd say uh, the most kind of navel gazing mode that I've ever kind of experienced as a writer I mean obviously I, I normally um write as a journalist but even then um with my columns and stuff I get edits back far more immediately whereas this has been you know totally. months and months and months of just me and I think it's meant that I have got quite disconnected and almost um 
um, I'd say un uprooted from the world. And, you know, sometimes, for perfect example, um, I was writing the book whilst the um, war in Ukraine was unfolding. And mm -hmm. it, it, it really took quite a bit for me to really kind of, um, I suppose, take myself out of my immediate world, which is the world that I was building with my characters, and really understand that, oh, you know, I don't know if we're allowed to, swear on you oh shit like you know that there's real stuff continually going on and um and um I know this might seem like quite a, a random comparison but me and my friend were also speaking about on social media where you know when things like wars break out when there are massive atrocities such as you know um the, the various shootings that take place in the states when there are things like police brutality that are then amplified on a global stage on social media and then you I don't know just as an example are on holiday in Mykonos and you're desperate to share your beach pictures. Exactly, pictures, yeah. You know, how do you then kind of justify um, the, the, I suppose, the, the tone deafness of continuing? But then what me and my friend were sort of discussing was, we, I remember when um, the, there was the, the last, no, was it last, oh my God, two years now since the tragic passing of George Floyd, we were talking about how we felt very much so that we didn't want to post and, engage on social media in a particular way because it felt tone deaf but then we also discussed that outside of that heinous evil incident there were also various other atrocities and horrendous things happening all the time so any day essentially that we choose to party or post or navel gaze writing our novels we're always turning a blind eye to something um, yeah. I wonder how you feel about that. Yeah, totally. And also, it, like, which atrocity? Like, if you were worried about Ukraine, then it was like, oh, but what about all of the similar stuff that's happening in the Middle East that we don't care about? <laughs> like, exactly yeah. like, that. I change, do I change my profile to, like, just a black square? Like, I yeah, I... That's so interesting about the switching between the navel gazing and the journalism, because I do both those things too. That's my beat is the alternation. Yeah. And I feel, I feel kind of wrong, no matter which one I'm doing, or, or I, maybe I could say, I feel like they, they have advantages and disadvantages, but I definitely have the experience when I'm doing journalism of being like, oh, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I don't know, I have to write about this person and this person's story. And I'm limited to like what they can tell me. And I'm limited to how honest they're going to be and to my ability to like, get the story from them and to and to what it happens to be. And, you know, shouldn't I just be writing about myself, because I have so much more information about myself, and I can go deeper, and I can take the story where I want to go. And then I switch over and, and, and also like, and also just the, the question of like fragmentation, when you write about the world, you get so scattered and you feel like you're ignoring things. And you, the, I don't know, the, the mind wasn't made to think about millions of people. I think we're set up, we're like built to think of like a hundred people maybe. Um, and that's not what we have, we have access to now. But then when I'm, I'm writing a novel, I, I get like, it's, it's exactly what you say, the editor, you know, it's not like a journalist. It's not like a magazine editor or a newspaper editor who's like emailing you every few hours saying like send me a draft or like you know nobody's asking you to sit and like do some whole excavation of your inner life and my my novel was um they're kind of historical novels based on my own past which has now become historical because I'm, I'm writing about the 90s which is when I was when I was in in college and university um and sometimes I'll just be sitting there and thinking like you know nobody asked me to write about like to think about something that upset me in like you know 1997 so why am I doing that when the whole rest of the world is like rightfully um and and correctly engaged with more pressing affairs but actually I had this um I I was rereading Proust also I had this trippy experience where uh at the end of Proust, it's it's also really party centric. He like goes to all these parties and then at the end he's like, oh I was a fool. I shouldn't have been going to these parties. But um, I should be sitting alone in a room and doing the only thing that's real work, which is this like excavation of the self and of interiority and of like, um, I don't know, this he doesn't call it psychoanalytic, but he's kind of like this psychoanalytic work that can only be done in solitude and in silence. And then he talks about journalism as like, of course, we have a temptation to like, for him, it's the Dreyfus affair. We have a temptation of, you know, World War One and the Dreyfus affair. We have a temptation to go outside of ourselves and try to like, 
write about the the world and, the, and be a part of the political moment, but that's a false temptation. And we're just going to fritter our energies like that, you know, like spewing out the correct takes. Mm. And actually the real work is what we do in solitude. So I have sort of like, I definitely think that there's a lot of value in both. And for me, I hope to continue to be able to switch between them both. But the way I kind of justify the navel gazingness of it all and, and, and the parties is that I don't know, like, I feel like as a function of going back and thinking about my past, I've started thinking about childhood in a really different way. I've been thinking about the role that childhood plays as kind of a, a public health concern and like actually the role that it plays in like, you know, Trump's childhood, Putin's childhood, like they're kind of revisiting their childhood trauma on a massive scale and all of these people like Trump was really an abused, unloved child who grew up in an atmosphere of right. terror. And, and we, and he created that for like, certainly everyone in the U S and all over the rest of the world too. And, and we all kind of know it and we talk about it like, oh yeah, of course, everyone knows that your child, but we don't treat it like a public health crisis, you know, but like, yeah. And then he like, and then it became, and then the pandemic was botched and like all these people died who didn't have to. And then children ended up being put in cages. And, um, so I do kind of think that we can, if we keep on just taking care of business and putting out fires, like we're not going to get to the kind of like addressing the actual causes, which requires you to sort of like remove yourself from the flow for a while to actually think about things. But yeah, how do you, how do you know that you're not just, you know, removing yourself from the flow? And because I don't know, because in some way I, it's, I guess it's more comfortable. Although I don't know, is it really more comfortable? It's, it's not actually that great to sit alone in a room with your thoughts, at least. No, <laughs> I certainly don't think so. Um, but yeah. I really love the way you kind of um, your positioning that kind of positioning of, I suppose, in a certain level of interiority and um, self reflection that doesn't necessarily. Um, I mean, it, it, it positions it as a greater good. It positions mm-hmm. it as something that, in you know, because I think there is something about you know um, self reflection, um, navel gazing um, that that can be seen as being narcissistic. But I feel like what you were saying really kind of um, makes it it sound like makes it. I don't know. It, it bestows it with a certain level of honor that I think often, um, at least I certainly um, can feel like I remove from when I'm writing about myself. So when I first started out in journalism, I specifically intentionally didn't write about myself at all um mm-hmm. I only ever because you're not people. supposed to they tell you're you not, not supposed to, to yeah. especially because they um you know I love that I love, you know the mythical they but you know it really is they like do tell you not to and especially when you're like a, a young woman starting out and there's a real pressure to kind of like um um unpack publicly and to um and I've so I always saw it in a particular way and saw it as you know, um, confession, any type of confessional writing is something that I should avoid to be to to be taken seriously. And it's only been in recent years that I've actually been able, I think, to write about myself in a way that I don't judge or I don't feel is narcissistic or anything else. And I think your kind of framing of it as something that you know it's so true about like childhood traumas, um, the things that essentially make us who we are today, being very much like swept under the rug as something that mm-hmm. you know it's just a real asterisk on someone's story when in reality it's everything <laughs> it's why we are who we are and why pretty much everything in the world um happens if that makes any sense <laughs> yeah and it, and it would be it's the most efficient way to fix things right because by right. the time that all this stuff has already happened like it's too late so yeah, yeah it feels like it really is more efficient and it does kind of feel like that's what novelists were on to that the thinking about yourself like I don't know if you like, just look at the, I guess there's, there's like psychoanalytic literature, which is about people's childhoods, but it's really, I feel like I learned that from novels, like, you know, whatever giant, you know, potentially annoying canonical novel that you read starts with the grandfather's grandfather. And when they were a little kid, like, mm-hmm. and, and the way that, that trauma is passed on between generations, like it does feel like that's something that, that literature, literature was somehow onto and that could become a helpful part of like the general discourse. I also feel like that voice that says, this is something that I engaged with a lot in my book, which is about, um, cause so I was doing um, creative writing programs in the nineties and there was a lot, I think it was even more than there is now. Although I can hear that for, for you, you know, I guess 15 years later, it was, um, or 20, you know what, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the math out for you some point later. <laughs> you, you got the same message, but 
Um, <laughs> but there, there's this strong message that says, if you think about yourself, you're narcissistic, you're self-indulgent, right. you're navel gazing. True, you know, true journalism is writing about other people. True art is like transcending yourself to have to be like Madame Bovary, say moi, which is really something that was designed for like, I don't know, like white men or, you know, some super privileged class of writers who's like right. responsible for producing everyone's literature as opposed to transcend themselves. But like now we're getting to the point where literature is more democratic. And I think we're realizing that the best equipped people to tell their stories are the people themselves who should Absolutely. be writing about. <laughs> and that's how we're going to get better information. Yeah. Like our literature is kind of full of lies because it's been like made by people who it's not about. And then the other thing I think is that like, I don't know, I'm, I'm super into, I'm a huge proponent of psychotherapy psychotherapy which I've been doing for years um but 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 I started relatively late I started in my in my like at thir when I was 37 um oh man that just sent me on a <laughs> train of thought <laughs> but I feel like the, like one of the things that I learned is like how to like there was this huge voice I had that was like don't complain other people have it worse than you you don't actually need therapy don't navel gaze don't be self-indulgent right. like just accurately position yourself in this hierarchy and realize how fortunate you are and how many people there are who are so much worse off than you and just basically shut up like and and I think that 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 consciousness of hierarchy of like the hierarchy of suffering it's really important, of course, that we like have a sense of perspective and like check our privilege and do all of those things. But it's also really important that we, I don't know, that we don't feel ashamed of taking our own problems seriously, such as they Absolutely. are. Because I think when we don't do the self-examination and the so-called navel gazing, which is sort of like a trolley word for like introspection, <laughs> I think like when, when we don't do that, the structures, especially the structure of the family, which is really based on um, on oppressing women and children. Like that's how it started. And it hasn't really moved that much beyond that. And the family is so built on keeping secrets. You know, it's, you don't air your dirty laundry. You don't, you know, this is stuff for private. You keep your secret. Your childhood was fine. You were really lucky. You were loved. You were happy. And, and I mean, I was really lucky and loved and happy, but I also had a lot of, like, I saw a lot of things that were deeply troubling and that made me mm. deeply troubled. And it's been, I found it really rewarding to, to look at those things and to think about them. And I feel like that actually makes me better equipped. Like, I guess the, the received idea is like, oh, if you're so like navel gazing and narcissistic, you're just thinking about yourself. But I feel like I wasn't able to even think about other people until I got to that stage of acknowledging myself and not just feeling so like ashamed and like just tight about it all the time I don't absolutely know. I'm gonna make it really basic but it's kind of like I don't know if you watch Drag Race but when RuPaul's <laughs> like if you don't love yourself <laughs> it's true are you gonna true. love someone else <laughs> exactly yeah it's, it's really and these true. things are kind of they're kind of cliche so like we think that we know them already and I certainly thought that I knew it already and yet for some reason I needed to do many years <laughs> of expensive therapy to really understand it and that's something that I'm trying to do in writing also because this is something I realized also like I just didn't have the time or the money to do therapy until like a somewhat advanced stage of life. And then I learned so much. And then I was just thinking, you know, everyone in New York City is in therapy. Like if you look at those buildings, like people are doing doing the work in like all yeah. of these little rooms and it's a big secret and you can't tell anyone. So I've really been thinking about like how, like what technologies can we think of with writing that will like kind of help other people reach that level of insight without having to reinvent the wheel and like sit for yeah. 400 hours in a room with like one person, the party, <laughs> the party of two, as it were. <laughs> mm. I, I, feel, I think it's also quite interesting as well, the difference, um, because as you said, everyone, not everyone, but everyone in New York, certainly, and I'd say a lot of people in London and across the world are doing the work. I think there is kind of difference or something that I guess I haven't even really yet worked out myself, but when you're doing that work and then it becomes, um, the results of it or your findings or that work becomes semi-public I mean as somebody who you know is is writing a novel but then you know as you said it's very much entwined with your own life I'm interested in I suppose what that's like because I very much at least with my um fiction book which definitely I would say there was a lot of myself in um mm -hmm. the characters I still feel like I've I mean I don't know I tried anyway to kind of like um hide within that but then as you know tends to happen the predominant um the main female character has ended up being a Nigerian woman who is a journalist at mm -hmm. a women's magazine as I was in 2017 um but I still try to like kind of 
make and she's from South London and I'm from South London but I still try to kind of like distance myself from that character for fear that I'd then be doing that processing publicly you Mm -hmm. don't shy away from that so I'm really interested in I suppose what that's like doing that on a, a, a public scale it was a huge journey it was a huge journey I write about this in my new book how at first when I started writing like when I was doing my first creative writing classes in like high school or college or whenever I would be like I have to write about a really universal person who has a name like Wendy or Karen you know (laughs) who like I'm not going to be writing about Turkish people all the time because I don't like it when people harp on about being from some particular country and they're like oh the food is like this and this is what I call my grandmother you know no I want to write like universal rigorous like human non-provincial things and but the more I would write like the more it would like my experiences did not and observations did not make sense unless the person was not completely American unless they had some other consciousness and I don't know enough about any other country to make it anywhere else but right. so then like in the end I would just end up with like a Turkish American girl in this part of New Jersey and yeah and I have stopped fighting it but it is it is a huge challenge. And it's it's especially a challenge because, I mean, I think the basic like kind of ethical problem is how do you write about your own experience, your own subjective experience truthfully? Okay, like the, a huge problem I've had is I feel guilt and an enormous sense of, an enormous sense of guilt and betrayal truthfully describing my own subjective experience because I feel rightly or wrongly that it implicates or betrays other people who are close to me. So it's wow. So I need that on a t-shirt. You just, I just, (laughs) I, I could make that my bike. Like you've just so succinctly, (laughs) completely just typified my entire experience writing a book that I still wouldn't even say is about myself. But yeah, sorry, Carol. It was just so perfectly put. I had to interview. Oh yeah, that's really moving to me that you feel that. I I think especially with mothers, it can be really complicated. I don't want to like because it's there's such a close relationship and there's so much sacrifice there, and so much yeah, so much love. Um, yeah, and I guess it's it's sort of a balancing act of how do I write about my own experience while protecting other people. And I've definitely had the experience. There was a whole novel that I that I basically tanked that was about a Turkish American journalist living in Istanbul writing for a New Yorker like <laughs> magazine. <laughs> That's like in the drawer because I couldn't figure out how to do it without it was too close to my life. And then I ended up writing these novels that are about my much younger self, which is has now, you know, 20 years ago. So that takes off a lot of the pressure. Right. I was gonna say, does that help? Aren't the distance? Those, yeah, it helps a lot because like the people you know, some of the, some of the relationships that are based on real people, I like contacted those people and I was quite lucky. And the people were basically like, lol, you wrote a whole book. Like, how do you remember all that stuff? That's so crazy. Cause like everyone has just like moved on. Yeah. Um, so that was good. But I mean, with the new one, I mean, it's, and, and a big part of the tour, I'm on book tour now. And a big part of the tour has been um, answering this question of like, how do the people who are in the book feel about it and how do you feel about it and the whole thing feels terrible like it really feels bad (laughs) but I think I think that it's um you know I guess I think that there's an ethical responsibility we do have an ethical responsibility to protect the people who are close to us and to keep secrets but I also think we have an ethical responsibility to other people like I think I don't know if you're in a group of writers like I started when I started going to book festivals I would like this was always what I was worried about and I'd always bring it up and like you would just hear people tell incredible stories and be like, oh, I'm going to write a book about that someday. And you're like, wait, you're already old. Like, why didn't you write a book about that yet? And they're like, well, waiting for my mother to die, you know, or like waiting for this person to die. Oh, and like, yeah. And then I, I've also been reading Alice Miller, who does this psychoanalytic criticism. And she writes about um, the lives of, of um, like Proust and, and Joyce and Kafka and like how I've been thinking about why are novels traditionally fictional? Like since like, why, why, why should the novel have a non direct relationship to like referential truth? Why is that the definition of the novel? And I actually think it might be to, to protect parents. And although I think that it's very legitimate to want to protect parents and to want to protect the people that we love, I think it's also a way that we end up protecting power structures that are actually cause a lot of pain. And I have had the experience of writing things that were more honest and more personal than I, you know, I went a little bit more honest and more personal in this book than I had in the previous book. And I've already had the experience of like 
people telling me how helpful that that was to them, that they recognized mm. things about themselves and that they hadn't seen this in a book before. And I do kind of feel like the books are, you know, the books that I read didn't have the information that I wanted because people were censoring themselves. So, and I also, the other thing I feel is that if I write about that, we're all kind of deformed by shame and that nobody in my book actually did anything shameful or anything bad. And that there's this kind of idea of like, oh, did you say something? There's like a gossipy idea that we all have that I have when I read books too. Like, oh, was this true? Did they really do that? Was that a real person? How did they feel about that? But it's kind of comes from this like, this sort of cult of secrecy and shame where it's like, if you tell anything about anyone, it's shameful, but like, but why should it be? Because like, we're all, we're all people. And I kind yeah. of feel like if it wasn't, if it wasn't a thing, it wouldn't be a thing. So like, Absolutely. how do we, how do we change it? You it's know? a real like garden of Eden kind of vibe where it's like <laughs> nakedness. <laughs> now it's, <laughs> if it wasn't a thing, then it wouldn't be a thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's what me. is there to be ashamed of? Yeah. yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's so interesting. And I think even when I think of, fictional sorry non-fiction writing when me and my best friend were co-writing our book we had so many conversations about this and obviously we couldn't shroud it in fiction because it was it was it was a non-fiction book so we had conversations about did, did she disclose what she did that you know at the time she was estranged from her family and we she, you know she'd come to live with my family and I had left university because of depression and it really was that kind of balancing act of like it, the value of you know keeping that secret in our lives versus mm -hmm. what that could do for somebody else which you know makes it sound like you know this you know huge transformative thing but it, but books really are like work like uh, like work like ours work like anybody's anybody who's writing it, it really is transformative so um it, it definitely comes to the level of responsibility and I just think the point you're making about um, that protectionism is so fascinating because I think being able to for instance, in my book, I write from a female perspective and they, it alternates between the um, male partner and his female fiance. And I'm, I'm always saying I don't I don't have many male friends. <laughs> Most of my friends are um, women, um, but the men that I do know, I know quite well. So I've borrowed so heavily from their experiences and lives. And and I've, and it has been I'm, I'm, I feel very grateful, at least to be able to hide behind the fact that it's um, fiction for their sakes, because I know that they feel you know reading it back I know for some of them it was quite it, it was quite something but the I, I feel like I've tried to anyway maintain the authenticity of their experiences and then just give the character like a different name but I guess it's a mishmash of my psyche theirs and then other people's it's kind of like created this mm -hmm. new new person yeah that sounds I mean that sounds like a really sane and and fascinating way to go about it and and I I can't wait for that book I I totally hear what you're saying about being like calling it fiction as a cover for everyone else in a way like it yeah I I don't know if you experienced this but I got a lot of kind of pushback and pressure that like well we all know that this thing this person you're writing about is just like you so why didn't you just write a memoir like why don't you just call it a memoir and it's it's kind of like if you're not drawing attention to the fact that it's all real like you should be kind of you should be allowed to, to put it in the novel. Yeah, that. it's really limiting yeah. as well, because it's like, I think what's so interesting about your approach has been that you've never shied away. I think, yeah, you've never shied away from the fact that there, that it's heavily based on your experiences. But, you know, as you sort of said, it's like about you. I, I don't know, your experiences are yours and everyone else's experiences are their own. And I don't know, I think I think it does feel quite limiting that it's kind of like it is either a memoir or mm -hmm. a fiction yeah. book I think it's amazing where you've approached it where you've kind of said to get those rules I'm gonna I, you almost like it sounds like you've kind of if not created a different sort of genre I mean I guess you've got like Narsgaard and he kind of builds up I've got them the phrase um auto, auto fiction yes auto fiction right yes um but yours almost feels more I don't know like I mean, I guess because the character even has a, has a different name. So I think it's a still, it's like a slightly different, it's, it's still a further degree of removal, but then simultaneously you're so open about the fact that it's heavily based yeah, on you. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, it's kind of like, when I got to a certain age, I was like, oh, am I going to start lying about my age? And then I was like, no, why would I lie about anything? Like, because like, and I, I have the impulse when I'm watching a TV show to be like, oh, is that person older than me or younger than me? And then I'll Google them and I'll see when they're born. Like, I, I just, I just want the information to be correct. And, you know, I spent a yeah. lot of time doing 
what you were describing, which is trying to keep the interiority and abstract away the experiences and assign them to someone else yeah. with different details. And I think the reason that I, I mean, I do that, I do try to do that to some extent with the characters who are not based on myself, but like the reason that I don't do that, like the whole reason that I wanted to write this book was to understand how I emerged from the nineties with this particular idea of myself and of how to live my life that now seems very benighted. And I didn't want to be like, Oh, that person was so dumb. Like, so I really wanted to reconstruct like, you know, how I knew about queerness, but I didn't think it was for me. I knew about feminism, but I didn't think it was for me. I knew about therapy, but I didn't think it was for me. So I wanted to like reconstruct all of that. And then I almost felt like if I made too much stuff up, I would be like messing up the experiment. I want to know yeah. how it actually happened, how things are real. But I'm really excited to like, I don't know. I loved what you said about a new genre and that it's a little bit different from auto fiction. Cause I do find the auto fiction, yeah. I've, I found it really helpful just about like, it's helped me to sell these books as novels, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I do find it kind of limiting and I'm really excited that there is like a new generation of people who are problematizing these things. And I'm like, I'm so happy we get to talk together and that maybe our work can be in dialogue too. And we can like Likewise. change this genre. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for a brilliant conversation. It's been so thank good talking you. to you and I cannot wait to read it. I can't wait to read your book either. And I, I hope we have a real conversation. I mean, not this. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> Another <too>. real conversation. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you so much.